With the death of Marcus Vitsanius Agrippa in 12 BC, Livia Drusilla, the wife of Caesar Augustus and ally of Marcus Agrippa, found herself in a precarious position. Livia had been married to Augustus for approximately 26 years, but she had given him no children, legal grounds for divorce for any other woman of Rome's upper classes. It was likely that the marriage between her son, Tiberius, and Agrippa's daughter, Vitsania, had rescued Livia from being cast aside as a barren wife by a husband who was the uncontested head of Rome's legions. Sharing a grandson with Agrippa, the man who was the uncontested heart of those legions, must surely have been a comfort to Livia. But his death changed everything. Livia soon found herself severely handicapped in the war of agendas between herself and Caesar Augustus, her husband, whose weapons included not only legions but lives. Tiberius was the first of her sons to become a casualty in that war. With Agrippa gone, she'd lost the ally she'd hoped would pave the way for Tiberius's favorable reputation among the legions. But her husband also saw to it that her son was then removed from association with Agrippa's daughter altogether, by forcing Tiberius to divorce Vipsania Agrippina, the woman he deeply loved, who was pregnant with their second child, to marry Julia, Augustus's own widowed daughter, and the mother of five of the late Agrippa's children. Then, following a state funeral during which Agrippa was eulogized by his sons-in-law, Tiberius and Publius Quintilius Varus, Augustus finalized the matter of his deceased friend's influence when he placed his remains within the mausoleum of Augustus, forever fusing the successful general's memory with that of the Caesars. And so, Livia was forced to continue her fight alone, forever separated from Marcus Agrippa, her dearest advocate. Tiberius did not carry the same weight with the legions as had Agrippa, whose authority had guaranteed Livia's protection. Moving forward, any military recognition Tiberius might acquire would be at the pleasure of his new father-in-law and military commander, Caesar Augustus. And Tiberius did not hold his commander's daughter, Julia, in quite the same high esteem as did her father, even alleging that Julia had propositioned him while she was married to Agrippa, proof to Tiberius that his former stepsister turned wife had low morals. Tiberius longed for his beloved Vitsania and knew that her own broken heart had caused her to miscarry their second child. On one occasion after his marriage to Julia, he happened to see her in the streets of Rome. Vitsania may not have felt his tear-filled gaze following her, but others saw him gazing after her and reported it immediately to Augustus. To prevent another public revelation of Tiberius's true affections, which might place his daughter Julia in an unfavorable light, Caesar Augustus stepped in as a surrogate paterfamilias and quickly arranged for Vipsania to marry another man. That man was the son of Gaius Asinius Pollio, a commander for Marcus Antonius in Gaul, who had been officially pardoned by Caesar Augustus in 30 BC for refusing to aid the enemies of Augustus. But Augustus's pardons came with conditions. And so, in 11 BC, Pollio's son, Gaius Asinius Gallus, agreed to wed Vitsania Agrippina at the request of Caesar Augustus. In 10 BC, Vitsania gave birth to Gallus's first child. In that same year, Tiberius fathered Julius' sixth child, and the shifting sands of Livia Drusilla's position became more stable. Finally, Caesar Augustus had legitimized his plebeian lineage with patrician blood. Although history has labeled the child Tiberius or little Tiberius, it's far more likely he was given some form of the names Tiberius, Julius, and Claudius. Now, with the Julian and the Claudian bloodlines of Augustus and Livia finally united in their shared grandchild, Livia's husband had everything he wanted. His first attempts to groom his nephew Marcellus had been thwarted by the legion's devotion to Agrippa. But now, not only was Agrippa gone, his spirit intricately woven into Rome's new Julian mythology, but Agrippa's sons were officially made Augustus's sons through their adoption instantly producing legal heirs to the name Caesar. Agrippa's eldest daughter was conveniently dispatched to an unrelated family who owed their very lives to Caesar Augustus, 
and Tiberius became immediately fixed as stepfather to Augustus's true heirs, young boys who would very soon outrank him. But Caesar Augustus had not yet taken into account the brilliant military career of Livia's second son, Nero Claudius Drusus. Tiberius had done well in the east under the command of Agrippa. He brought home three of Rome's lost eagles and continued to impress the people of Rome with his campaigns along the Danuvius River, as well as with the annexation of the kingdom of Noricum, which he had achieved in tandem with his brother. But it was Livia's youngest son who was covering himself in glory on the other side of the Rhine River. Driving both land and naval forces through Germania, Drusus worked tirelessly to expand Rome's border beyond its current position at the Rhine, hoping to see it extended all the way to the Elbe River. Not only had he repaired and built new roads through the Alps, greatly improving passage from Italy to Germania, but he had erected approximately 50 fortified military camps along the Rhine and deep within Germania's interior, even being the first to winter within Germania's Taunus Mountains. His naval forces had explored the North Sea, sailing as far as Jutland, and his architects had constructed canals which allowed ships to more readily reach Germania's inland lakes. Following a brutal ambush led by the Cherusci near the foothills of the Taunus Mountains, Drusus succeeded in leading the majority of his legions to safety on the banks of the Rhine, where he was officially hailed as Imperator. But when Drusus returned to Rome with his family, which now included a third child, Livia's husband denied her son the right to be addressed as Imperator, a name which implied superb leadership of Rome's legions. Elected to the consulship for the 9 BC year, the 29-year-old Drusus was also voted a triumph by the Senate of Rome. But just as Imperator had become a title Caesar Augustus reserved solely for himself, so also was a triumph not permitted for the stepson of Caesar Augustus. Drusus was instead allowed to celebrate an ovation, a lesser form of a triumph. Rather than riding in the traditional four-horse quadriga along the triumphal parade route and sacrificing a bull in the temple of Jupiter Optimus Maximus, Drusus walked the route and waved at the crowds. His face was not painted red, and he was not authorized to wear the purple and gold-bordered toga picta of the triumphator. Instead of the thundering of trumpets, the parade was held to the whistling of flutes, after which Drusus sacrificed a sheep in the great god's temple. In this way, Drusus was celebrated for his military victories without ostensibly surpassing Caesar Augustus, who was head of Rome's legions, and therefore their only triumphator. But, after presenting military successes not seen in Rome since the days of Julius Caesar, being rewarded with a lesser ovation likely failed to please the son of Livia Drusilla. After leaving Rome to return to the German front with his family, Drusus wrote a letter to his brother, Tiberius. In the letter, Drusus complained bitterly of their stepfather's tyranny and of his hold over the legions, which gave him absolute power over Rome and her government. In his letter, Drusus suggested that together he and Tiberius compel Caesar Augustus to lay down his office and truly restore the Republic, as opposed to paying lip service to the Republic's restoration, as Augustus had done repeatedly over the previous decade. Sadly for Drusus, this letter eventually found its way into the wrong hands, the hands of Livia's husband. While all of Rome was pleased with the military exploits of Livia's son, Criticisms of Drusus' of actions somehow reached the ears of Livia's husband, who was now growing so wary of her son's immense popularity with the legions that he was quite open to any complaints brought against him. Drusus was reckless, said the reports. Having returned to the front in the spring of 9 BC, and while ruthlessly blazing his way through Germania, Caesar's stepson had suddenly become obsessed with the spolia opima, a very rare honor which had been denied Marcus Licinius Crassus, the third person in approximately 700 years to meet the stringent requirements for dedicating an enemy commander's armor to Jupiter. The denial had come from whom else but Caesar Augustus himself, who had blocked the dedication on a flimsy technicality. Should Augustus Caesar deny yet another commander the right to dedicate the spolia opima, especially when that commander was his own stepson, 
the whole of the Roman world might finally question his motives. Informants advised Caesar Augustus that Drusus, upon seeing any opposing commander, would immediately bolt out of formation, putting the legions at risk by breaking the chain of command so that he might pursue the German chieftains all over the battlefield. Several times Drusus' pursuit of the Spolia Opima's glory brought him close to his goal, cornering a chieftain or commander. But Drusus ultimately failed each time to unhorse and defeat the enemy commander before his opponent was rescued by his own men, who usually rushed their commander off the battlefield at once. Then came the news that Drusus had abruptly stopped at the Elbe River, refusing to venture beyond and into the Sioux Epi territories. Drusus claimed an encounter with a mysterious giant, shade, or witch, as the reason for this abrupt stop. She had issued a dire warning that he leave Germania at once. For Livia's husband, this was the last straw. Her son had put his name to a letter which indicated his desire to use military might as a means of forcing Augustus from power, a clear declaration of civil war. At the same time, while seeking to enhance his own personal reputation with the legions, Drusus had placed his men in harm's way by recklessly pursuing vain honours, and now he had ceased his conquest of Germania altogether. Caesar Augustus wrote Drusus at once, ordering his stepson to return to Rome immediately. Drusus quickly replied, respectfully promising to return to Rome just as soon as he was able to travel again, citing a temporarily disabling accident as the reason he was currently unable to travel. This left Livia Drusilla in an even more precarious position. Her husband was suspicious, he was paranoid, and now he was angry. And her son, Drusus, with the whole of the Rhine legions at his back, dared to refuse a summons to Rome from his stepfather, the mighty Caesar Augustus.